Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I am happy to be with you for another episode, another Tuesday episode of the podcast. As often happens on Tuesday, we do have an author interview today, which I am excited to share with you. I mentioned on Thursday's episode that I would be speaking with author Sonia Faruqi about her debut novel called The Oyster Thief. And we chatted over the weekend about this this book that one of the things that I really like about this book is that it um, it sort of crosses genres. It's got a part... Well, here, let me read you. Let me read you the description first. So Coraline is a mermaid who is engaged to the merman of her dreams. But when an oil spill wreaks havoc on her idyllic village life, her little brother falls gravely ill. Desperate to save him, she embarks on a quest to find a legendary elixir made of starlight. Izar, a human man, is on the cusp of an invention that will enable him to mine the depths of the ocean. His discovery will soon make him the richest man on earth while threatening merpeople with extinction. But then, suddenly, Izar finds himself transformed into a merman and caught into caught in a web of betrayal and intrigue. Meeting Coraline in the ocean, he decides to join her on her quest for the elixir, hoping it will turn him human again. The quest pushes Coraline and Izar together, even though their worlds are at odds. Their pasts threaten to tear them apart, while a growing attraction adds to the danger. Ultimately, each of them faces an impossible choice. Should Coraline leave her fiancé for a man who might betray her? And Azar has a dark secret of his own, one that could cause him to lose Coraline forever. So that is the description of this book. It's um, it's partly an adventure story. It's partly fantasy. The part under the water, there's, you know, this quest for kind of a magical elixir there. It's partly science fiction. Azar is an inventor and he invents something that will, that that might be possible somebody with more science knowledge than I would know if it was if it's possible but you know it's got that science fiction edge where it's technology that seems maybe plausible but maybe not plausible and I don't want to give away too much but so you've got this above world that is basically the world that we live in but they know about they know that mer people exist they know that that world exists under the ocean um so they've got kind of contemporary science fiction above water and then this kind of fantasy world below water. There is a bit of romance thrown in. It's just, there's so many genres interspersed here. And I just, I found the entire concept really intriguing. Um, and then the book is, it's both beautifully written and a lot of fun and just I keep saying intriguing because I was very intrigued by the concept and then very intrigued by the story as well. So I want to get to the interview with Sonia so she can talk a little bit more about what went into the writing of the book and what was her inspiration, etc. And then I have a few more thoughts that I'll share with you at the end, in addition to the fact that this is a giveaway opportunity. So I have copies of The Oyster Thief to give away. So stay tuned to the end of the podcast to find out how you can enter to win a copy of The Oyster Thief by Sonia Faruqi. And here is that interview with Sonia. Actually, in a second is the interview with Sonia. So I have to apologize to both Sonia and you, the listeners, because apparently I hit uh, the wrong button on the the software that I record on and didn't realize it in time. So the very first 
few sentences that Sonia says are cut off. You know, usually I say, welcome to the podcast. And then the author speaks and Sonia spoke and said lovely things. And then when I asked her to introduce herself, I missed the first like one sentence of that. So she does come in. It sounds a little abrupt. I apologize for that. I apologize to Sonia and I apologize to you. But thankfully, I caught it before it was, you know, half the episode or half the interview. So it's just a little bit that got cut off. And again, my apologies, but uh, enjoy the rest of the interview. Hi, Sonia. Welcome to the podcast. I'm excited to have you. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, we are here to talk about your book, The Oyster Thief. Before we do that, I would love for my listeners to get to know you just a little bit. So anything that you uh, would like to share about yourself would be great. I graduated from Dartmouth College with an economics degree, and then I worked on Wall Street um, before deciding that I wanted to write books. Um, my first book was Project Animal Farm, which was nonfiction, uh, which came out in 2015. And my second book, The Oyster Thief, coming out now is uh, a move uh, toward fiction. So I've had quite a few um, sort of career changes and shifts over the last years, which have kept everything very interesting. Yeah, it sounds like it. So um, talk a little bit about The Oyster Thief. Uh, the Oyster Thief is um, what I would call in book terms, it's a literary fantasy. Uh, it's a book that I hope it, or intended to do in a well-written sort of way because I love beautiful prose and I love a depth and meaning. Um, and it's also a fantasy in that it consists of a different world. I um, came to the topic quite organically. It was a January 1st 2015, where I live in Toronto, Canada. And uh, if you've ever been here, it's not like California. It's kind of freezing <laughs> in winter. <Yeah. laughs> and um, I was just looking out the window, sitting on the couch, and I wanted to escape underwater, or rather to the water. Uh, but I couldn't. I had nothing booked for the immediate future. So I made a cup of tea and I switched on my laptop and I just started creating an underwater world myself. Hmm. Uh, and so it was very um, sort of sudden and impulsive and it took me quite some time because now we're in 2018, almost uh, four years from that date. Um, and I've really enjoyed creating a world of people and their culture and um, the people themselves uh, use science and my imagination both to um, sort of guide my way. Fun. Um, I, I love that, that you're wanting to take a vacation turned into a book. Um, can you talk a little bit about the inspiration for the story itself? I mean, that was your inspiration for the world. How about the story itself? Uh, the story took me a bit longer. It um, it was actually quite uh, tough in some ways um, because in nonfiction, when I wrote Project Animal Farm, the book traces my journey going to farms around the world. Mm -hmm. And so it's a um, narrative account of uh, my personal story, uh, which happened. And so I didn't need to use my imagination very much except in the language itself, uh, but not in the events that were themselves unfolding. Whereas uh, in The Oyster Thief, um, I found that I really had to um, think a lot more and more deeply. I essentially had three, a three-part process for the book, um, or it has three components rather, the story, the setting, and the characters. Um, I started with the setting, the underwater world, and then the characters, uh, Coraline and Azar, and then the story came more out of uh, the setting and the characters and how they were intersecting. Um, overall, I had this concept of an elixir, a quest for an elixir, a life-saving elixir that exists in the ocean. And so that's uh, one of the themes uh, you'll see that's uh, connecting different parts of the story. Uh, but beyond that, it's a mix of the setting and the characters and uh, things that are happening in the lives of these characters. Mm -hmm. And 
Um, speaking of the characters, uh, the, the main characters, Coraline and Azar, can you talk about them a little bit? And what do you think about them will resonate with readers? Coraline is a 20-year-old mermaid. Uh, she's uh, my favorite character in the book, actually. Um, she lives in a little village called Urchin Grove, and she's someone who's uh, very reliable, really nice, uh, someone you would like to know in your personal life, uh, someone who would not let down her friends or family. At the same time, uh, she's also ambitious in her own ways. Uh, she's an apprentice apothecary at a clinic called uh, the Irregular Remedy, and she works hard. She's very passionate about her work of uh, healing others, um, and she gets engaged uh, to the most eligible merman in the village uh, called Eklon. And at the same time, she she is partly conventional because of her mother, Abalone, who's um, a bit of a dominating figure in her life. But at the same time, she has thoughts of her own and ideas of her own of um, wanting to explore. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the influences in her life is actually her best friend, Pavanus, who's a whale shark. Uh, he's about uh, 30 feet long. He's a really sarcastic and abrasive character, but really funny as well. And so she has these different influences in her life, and she's living a happy life, uh, even if it's uh, quite a sheltered life. Um, Izar, on the other hand, is a very is very different than Coraline. He's a 28 year old inventor. He's an engineer who works at Ocean Dominion. Uh, he leads the company along with his um, adoptive father and his brother. Um, and he's someone who dislikes mer people uh, because he believes they killed his biological parents. Um, he's quite a serious guy, I would say, very smart, but he's had a troubled past, and he doesn't quite understand his past. Um, but he's really uh, sharp, and he wants his father to, his adoptive father to love him. Uh, part of that relates to his inventing underwater fire, which will pave the way to mining ocean diamonds and gold. Um, now, one thing I should note, Sarah, is this concept that I devised of um, underwater mining. It was fictional when I devised it, but just last year, actually, it has become fact. Oh, my gosh. Uh, companies, yes, <laughs> uh, companies are uh, mining the oceans for diamonds, and uh, next year... And they're going to be starting with gold. It's uh, pretty damaging ecologically because the way they do it, um, they break open the seabed and they haul a lot of it out and they take the precious aspects of it and then just dump everything overboard. Um, and much of the life in the ocean is concentrated around uh, the seabed as well as the surface. Uh, but it was interesting to me that um, you know, fact and fiction really are not necessarily that uh, different. Yeah. Uh, they do have um, elements of a, bit, a lot of truth in fiction, and uh, some things that happen in real life seem kind of fictional, but are actually facts. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. On that somewhat chilling note, we do have to take our first break of the podcast. But when we come back, we'll be talking uh, more about the book, more about the story, and um, some about the research that Sonia did put into creating this world, creating the science behind it, creating the fantasy of the world building of below the water. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and we'll be right back. Still on the search of that one true love? On the limbo in this crazy world of dating, marriage, relationships. Well, listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Relationship Podcast. Your one-stop podcast for everything about relationships.
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with Sonia Faruqi about her debut novel, The Oyster Thief. And we were talking before about the um, the the invention that Azar creates and how some of that has become fact rather than fiction in the world we live in, which then leads me to my next question for her. Which actually leads me to my next question of, um, so what kind of research did you do in terms of, especially Azar's character, because he is an inventor and he does create underwater fire. So did you do research for those elements? Oh, absolutely. I love research. <laughs> it's um, in my nonfiction background, but I love research because then I'm constantly learning. Uh, here I did a lot of first-hand research in the form of uh, snorkeling, scuba diving, and even swimming with sharks. <laughs> I wanted to portray the um, underwater world in a way that is actually true, uh, both from a sensory perspective and the factual perspective. Uh, on the factual side, I read hundreds of articles and lots of books about the ocean, um, like about seashells and about algae, uh, about animals. I actually had an Excel file with um, so many different kinds of algae. Uh, for instance, Izar, Izar's background is as an inventor, and he's all about physics mostly, which uh, actually I don't love <laughs> as much as I wish I did. Uh, so I had to think about the chemistry of underwater fire. And that hasn't been invented because, um, you know, fire and water sort of uh, don't go together. Right. Um, there's a comment in the book, water vanquishes fire and... Um, something of the reverse, I can't remember the exact line. But I had to think more about how it would work uh, from that perspective. Um, and there's an oil spill that we see in the book, and I had to think more about how that works. Um, mostly, though, the research was relating to the water, even sunlight in the water. Um, for instance, I wanted the mer people to have sources of light, because uh, one of the challenges is that most of the ocean is actually pitch black because it's so deep and light doesn't go that deep. Um, so the mer people live in pockets that are called the sunlight zone, which is down, which is not very, very far deep, uh, but sunlight does penetrate. And at night, they need a source of light, or in general, when they're going deeper. Um, so I use bioluminescence which is common in the ocean. Bioluminescence is actually um, a lot of uh, creatures like algae, animals, and bacteria will light up in the dark. And that's how they're navigating their way and communicating in the dark. Uh, so the ocean is a bit like the night sky, I would say. And the mer people, they use uh, orbs that are filled with this bioluminescent bacteria uh, that helps guide them in the dark. Um, and Coraline, of course, is an apothecary, and so she needs to know seaweeds really well. And, and there's 10,000 kinds of seaweeds, uh, some of which we do know well. Uh, for instance, Devil's Apron is a sugar kelp. So I devised that as a dessert right. in the oyster thief, or um, particular algae with particular components. I sort of use them in a way that would culturally fit within the world of more people. And so it was it was a process, but it was a lot of fun to moor the story within a setting that is pretty much, I would say, scientifically accurate um, to the extent I was capable of and to the extent that uh, much of the ocean is actually less known than the moon. Um, but based on what we know to date and based on what I could glean, I view it as if if more people existed, they could uh, feasibly live in the way that I portray them. Mm -hmm. And so you did the research and then talk a little bit about the world building that went into the underwater world, because you had to, as I was reading through, you know, you have to, you have to think about, um, well, you're underwater. So how do liquids work underwater for, for drinking or how, you know, how do, do they need chairs? Do they have beds? All of those things. Uh, how did you envision and create that underwater world? 
I thought about it quite a bit, and it was uh, different for uh, different areas. Um, they do have chairs made of stone and furniture made of stone. Uh, so I looked into what kinds of stones exist underwater and then what kinds of uses they could have. There are There's limestone that they can use, there's slate, um, there's shale, and there's also some things that they use in a jewelry sort of context, like olivine or peridot. Um, so I created their culture around these existing stones. And I should also mention the story is set in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so I wanted to ensure that everything that's existing in this particular story of these particular characters is um, found in the Atlantic, whether we're talking about the stones or anything else. It was, um, it was interesting and enjoyable to think about that. In terms of the way they eat, they use uh, stone sticks, which are a bit like chopsticks. And uh, for liquids, they don't need to drink water because it's constantly filtering through their gills. But they do drink wine. And there are actually sea grapes. There are different kinds of grapes in the ocean. Uh, so the way they do it is they make a wine out of these grapes, um, much like we might on land. And it's in a sort of flask that has a lid that um, only opens when you touch it to your mouth. It's just the mechanism of how the stopper on the flask is. Uh, so all of these uh, things uh, came together, whether the currency, also um, they use shells as currency. And interestingly, some cultures on land have also used uh, shells as currency. Um, so, uh, But so I said that these different kinds of shells have different purposes. Like these ones are currency, those ones are jewelry or these shells are buttons. Um, it just went from that and keeping track of the different uses and what would make sense in a particular context. Uh, so I, yes, I really enjoyed the world building and it came partly from the science and partly from my imagination as well based on what I thought would be kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. And actually, I was I was glad when you explained the um, the mechanism for the the way they they drank the wine because I kept thinking how is this how is this staying in? <laughs> and then you explained it, so I was happy. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I would like to talk a little bit more. You mentioned Pavonis, um, Coraline's best friend, and her parents each have that you call them muses. So talk a little bit about what is a muse and what function does it play in the story? I wanted there to be animal characters in the Oyster Thief uh, because it would just be fun. Uh, and there's I wanted to highlight the diversity as well in the ocean beyond the merpeople. Um, muses are animals whom you bond with it's your animal best friend in a sense. Uh, Coraline's is the shark, and her father's muse is a seahorse. Um, it could be a bit of, you know, your best friend might be exactly like you, or your best friend might be quite different than you. Um, her father is a, a serious and very nice sort of person, and the seahorse, uh, Altair, is... Um, kind of similar. He's a bit moralistic. Now, seahorses are monogamous, and they're very serious about their mate, and even after their mate dies, they never find another mate, which is really quite uh, romantic, and they do a morning dance with their partner every morning. Uh, at least lined seahorses do. Uh, so this Altair and her father's uh, characters are a bit similar in that sense and that they're very devoted to their responsibilities and um, to a certain sort of way of life. Uh, her mother, meanwhile, Coraline's mother, Avalone, is uh, more gossipy and uh, more social and extrovert. And her snail, her muse is a snail who often sits on her shoulder. And um, the snail, Naker, 
uh, sits on the right shoulder because she says, I'm always right. <laughs> <laughs> and she uh, usually has some sorts of remarks to make about um, people and about the environment that are uh, sometimes a bit uh, snarky. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a world of mer people and animals. Uh, coexisting in a peaceful and harmonious way. Uh, it's a bit different than land in that there isn't this um, sort of tension between the existence of these people and their environment. They are a part of the environment and it's a part of them um, and it all sort of uh, works together. Mm-hmm. We do need to take one more break before we conclude this episode. I do want to say how impressed I am with the the thought and the detail that Sonia put into not only the research, but every, everything about this book. I mean, she just thought about, it feels like she thought about every aspect of this book and tried to make it as accurate and realistic as possible, even though part of it is, um, you know, kind of a fantastical fantasy world that takes place under the water. And I just really appreciated listening to her talk about what all went into creating this world, creating the characters, creating the story. Um, So we do have to take that break. When we come back, we'll be concluding the interview. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and we'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion to my interview with Sonia Faruqi about her debut novel, The Oyster Thief. And I also wanted to ask you about um, the char- some of the character names um, because you're, you're very fond of alliteration, which I appreciate. I love alliteration. Um, was, that, was there a reason that you chose alliterative names or did that just kind of happen as you were writing? Right. <laughs> Um, I, you're right, I do like alliterations. The names of uh, the characters came from the sea and the stars. Uh, all the characters are named after some aspect of the ocean or some aspect of the universe. Um, Coraline, for instance, her name relates to a kind of algae. Her father, Trochid, is a coral connoisseur and his job with the under Ministry of Coral Conservation is to protect coral reefs. Um, her and so he calls her Coraline because this algae Coraline, which is a beautiful pink algae, it grows on reefs and indicates the health of a reef. Um, her fiance Eklon, his name comes from a kind of kelp that is uh, strong and durable. Uh, abalone and nacre come from the shell or the snail that makes pearls, and that relates to their beauty and their view that beauty is important. Um, so they were sometimes alliterative. Um, mostly, I wanted to find names for the characters that related to their personality and to their world. Um, just because that moors it a bit more. Uh, For instance, I wouldn't be able to call smart people names like 
Sonia or Sarah <laughs> right. because uh, that they have a different culture and uh, their influences in their lives are different. Uh, so they wouldn't have the same kinds of names. Uh, personally, sometimes I have alliterative names because I think it sounds uh, nice to hear and it's also a bit easier for me to keep track of mm-hmm. uh, who's who. Um, if different people in the family have uh, some sort of theme or if the first name or last name relate to each other in some way, even if it's not necessarily apparent to the reader the direct relationship. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. So you've mentioned your first book a couple of times, Project Animal Farm. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Project Animal Farm started very organically for me. After Wall Street, I moved to Toronto because my family was moving here, my parents, and I wanted to be closer to them. I wanted a vacation as well because I'd worked very hard on Wall Street and never taking any vacation or any sick days or anything at all uh, because it was a very intense uh, sort of place. I decided to volunteer at a dairy farm um, thinking in the back of my mind and from looking at the website that it would be a beautiful and peaceful pastoral sort of place and I would uh, go there, enjoy myself and come back to the city and then continue looking for jobs in finance. Now what happened was uh, very different. At this uh, farm I went to I found that the cows were really not treated well, they were not outdoors. much at all, and they were mostly tied to stalls. Uh, It was really a cramped environment. I viewed it a bit as a cow in a stall being a bit like a Bigfoot in a small shoe. Mm -hmm. It's just not comfortable, especially for these creatures that weigh around 1,300 pounds on average. Um, Then I I met more farmers there. I went to their farms as well because I was curious to see how does the rest of farming look like. As I saw pigs, turkeys, chickens, and I really found it um, troubling, and the treatment of the animals and everything about the farms. It was a bit of a dystopian experience, I would say, um, and I decided that I could go back to Wall Street or I could stay here and really try to make things better. Then I decided that I needed to learn more, and I went to farms in several countries, uh, the United States, Mexico, Belize, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, the United Arab Emirates, uh, to see more about the problems and the solutions as well. Um, My recommendation is relating to producers and consumers, Uh, We need more laws to protect animals and to generally have some level of oversight into the system Uh, because much of it is operating behind closed doors and we don't have any sense of where our food is coming from, although we are starting to become smarter about that. Um, That was part of it. Another part of it was ourselves thinking about how we're eating and do we really want our dollars to be supporting Uh, factory farms um, that are really bad for the environment and the animals and the workers, or would we be willing to support uh, more plant-based eating and also farms that are um, more conscientious and um, not viewing animals or workers as objects? So it was a very fulfilling and interesting, but also at times a difficult book to write. Um, but I've been happy at the reception, both uh, critically and, and in terms of uh, the people who've read it. Uh, many people have emailed me that uh, the book changed my life, and now I think differently, I live differently, and I eat differently, and I was illuminating for a lot of people, uh, which I uh, found really fulfilling. Yeah, that's fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, can you talk a little bit about then the differences you found when you switched from 
writing a pretty personal nonfiction first book to writing mm -hmm. uh, fiction? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I had to learn how to write fiction. I initially thought that, hey, I've written a book, and so I should be able to write something else relatively easily. Um, but it really wasn't easy. I spent about 2,000 hours on the earlier version of The Oyster Thief, um, over two and a half years. And then I just threw it all out. I started from scratch. Oh, wow. Because um, the story wasn't really very intricate. I hadn't researched the ocean much. Uh, it didn't feel deep. And so I decided that although I could publish it and although my publisher had said yes to that book, I knew I could do a lot better. Um, then I really started to think deeply, and I spent about three months planning the book from the setting and the science to the characters and the story itself uh, that they would be embarking on. Um, and that more serious approach really helped me. I had this sort of idea, which I think many people have, that in fiction you're kind of going with the flow. You have some brilliant thought, you write it down, and then that leads to the next thought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I found that planning was actually much more essential even than uh, nonfiction because, um, you know, it's important to have intriguing elements and something that um, is well thought out. Otherwise, uh, a work might sprawl or it might not it might be going in directions that are not really very productive or interesting. Um, so having that more top-down approach rather than just waiting for sparks of inspiration and then just writing them down, the top-down approach really helped me and was also more um, conducive to my personality, I would say. Mm -hmm. And so you came to writing in, you know, kind of a... a, a not straightforward way um, with, with your experiences and then you're writing your first book. Is it something that you'd thought about before before you wrote your first book as something you wanted to do or did you really just come to it because of the circumstances you found yourself in? More the latter. It was really the circumstances. Um, both the books were very organic from in terms of the original spark and uh, if I hadn't gone to that farm or gone to other farms, I would never have thought of writing a book. Uh, now, with my personality and background, Wall Street was a very natural fit for me. I love numbers. I love Excel, and I love um, strategic sort of analysis, uh, whereas writing is more art-based. And even though there is research in it, ultimately what you're coming up with is a work of art. Uh, particularly with fiction. Um, and I've really come to like it over time and feel more comfortable with it over time. Originally, it was very difficult to to come up with sentences. And um, I've changed a lot because I love the beauty of writing now. I love the sound of language. I write a lot with my ear, maybe too much, hence the alliteration <laughs> that you noticed. No, I like um, alliteration. But, <laughs> but the sounds are uh, very important to me, and um, I, I am definitely more comfortable, but it, it took me a while to get uh, to this stage of comfort. Um, and perhaps, you know, perhaps it'll always be a growth experience, even if I'm writing for the next uh, 50 years. Uh, most likely it will be a growth experience still, which is good. Mm -hmm. That is good. Um, so are you working on anything else right now? Uh, there might be a sequel to The Oyster Thief. Okay. <laughs> I would uh, find it enjoyable to continue the stories of uh, Coraline and Izar. And um, I won't say uh, too much, but the book almost ends on the note of there being a potential sequel. I was just going to say that. <laughs> I, I felt like there was room. Yes, I've been thinking about it. I haven't uh, started writing. Mm -hmm. 
um, but it could involve a journey to another ocean. Uh, it could be from the Atlantic to the Arctic or elsewhere, uh, and there would be some more characters and some of these same characters. Um, it would be, I, I, I'm hopeful it wouldn't uh, be the case like with this book where I threw it all out and started from scratch because now I find that I have the foundations of this underwater world and I really love this world. Uh, so it would be interesting and enjoyable for me to dive back into it and um, see what happens. Yeah, okay. Um, do you have advice for aspiring authors? I'm glad you asked, and it's something I was thinking about uh, today itself, uh, even for myself, because this Oyster Thief book is out just now, and I'm thinking a bit more long-term now, perhaps, than I was over the last uh, couple of months. Um, I would say view it as a long game. Uh, there are so many authors whose first books or whose second books or whose fifth books uh, were not commercially successful, but they kept going, they kept at it, and um, eventually they did find that people came to appreciate and know them and their work. Uh, so I find it a bit hard at times uh, because, you know, it's a lot of work and we want results now, uh, especially in the world of Instagram and Twitter um, and generally everything is so fast moving today that we sort of want results immediately. But with books, I find it takes time to write it, it takes time to get it out, it takes time for people to read it and to talk about it and to get to know the author themselves. Um, and I would just view it as a sort of long-term thing rather than expecting sudden fame or sudden riches because although that does happen, sometimes it's really a very tiny minority of authors mm -hmm. who are that fortunate. Yep. And many of them, we may hear of a particular book and read it and love it, but we may not know that that's that person's 12th book. Uh, there were many others that we did not know of before that. I would just keep that in mind, uh, just viewing it as a long-term career rather than a one-book wonder sort of mindset. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Do you have um, favorite genres and authors when you read for yourself? That's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> I read um, mostly nonfiction, actually, mm -hmm. and... Uh, most of my bookshelf of the six shelves, five are nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Only one of them is fiction. Uh, I've loved uh, the Harry Potter series. I thought that was beautifully written. And, and from the writer's perspective, I know that keeping a story going over multiple books is not easy. Mm -hmm. That's why often there's a first book, and it's very good. And the second book will still maybe sell a lot because people are waiting for it, but it may not be nearly as good as the first one. Um, but I found that it was so well executed over all the books. Um, I love philosophical fiction. Uh, particularly, I like Ayn Rand. And uh, she wrote Atlas Shrugged and The Fountainhead. And I, not, I don't necessarily agree with all her philosophies, um, these days, especially, she's associated a lot with the far right. But I love how beautifully she writes and how she um, mixes a story into points of view. Uh, for instance, the oyster thief has themes of ocean conservation uh, within the story, whether we're looking at the diamond mining itself or whether we're looking at the oil spill or more broadly, whether we're looking at the mer people existing in this oceanic world and so their natural desire to want to protect that world. Um, and, I, and I just uh, thought she does it very skillfully and beautifully over works that are often a thousand pages in length. 
in nonfiction, I like uh, books on food topics or animal welfare topics. I also like uh, self-development works, uh, books on, it could be a particular topic like networking or it could be about happiness or um, organization or something else, but uh, different kinds of things. Sometimes I'm reading multiple books at the same time on my e-reader and I just uh, sometimes have a mood for this and I have a mood for that on different days. Uh, so it's uh, quite uh, eclectic, I would say. Okay, thank you. Um, I know you have a website, so tell people where they can find your website and where they can find you on social media. My website is uh, soniafaruki.com. Uh, that's uh, the spelling of my name, S-O-N-I-A-F-A-R-U-Q-I.com. Uh, you'll see its a website I've uh, redone recently with my talented designer. It's an animated website, <laughs> so it's uh, fun to visit. It's, um, I'm also sending out a monthly newsletter, which includes a lot of information on my books or events and book giveaways as well are quite common. Um, and also information more generally about the ocean and the planet and other things that uh, come up that are of interest. On the social media, I'm on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. Um, on Instagram and Twitter, it's at Sonia underscore Faruqi. And on Facebook, it's at uh, Faruqi Sonia. Um, I'm also very responsive to emails, actually. People do reach out to me often. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, they can email me at info at com, And I'm usually pretty uh, quick to reply to my emails. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and all that information, the links and stuff will be in the in the blog post that goes with this article so people can find you um, pretty easily. Perfect. Is there anything else that you would like for people to know about you or your books or writing, anything that we haven't touched on? I think we've uh, touched on a lot of uh, different topics. Um, I would say that uh, for those who read the book, I would love uh, to know your thoughts on the book. Um, before I started writing, I didn't really realize how much it means when readers reach out directly to the author. Uh, but I love hearing people's thoughts on um, my work. I would say that uh, I I do believe we're living in a time where um, our actions are important and small things can make big differences. Um, on the topic of the ocean, I never came to it from a conservation perspective as such, because I just started the book, as we mentioned, quite organically, just in winter wanting a water escape. But now I do find that there are easy things we can do to help the oceans, uh, which are struggling under uh, some human influence. Uh, we can try to eat more sustainably. We can uh, also think about things like our sunscreen. Uh, many of us want to go to coral reefs to see the reefs, and uh, that's a wonderful thing to do. But uh, what we don't realize is that the sunscreens that we use, chemical sunscreens, almost all of them, are very damaging to reefs. Even a couple drops of these sunscreens uh, can kill coral reefs. Uh, so I recommend using mineral sunscreens. These sunscreens can be found in um, health food stores, or can, usually I just order them online. They're not expensive, and they're very high-quality sunscreens um, that are based on natural ingredients uh, rather than chemicals that uh, kill nature. Uh, so that's something easy that everyone can do. Uh, we can also think about uh, our use of plastic. Uh, one of the issues facing the ocean, sadly and strangely, is uh, just all the plastic that ends up in there. Um, and plastic doesn't biodegrade. It's, it can be considered almost a chemical in that it's fully man-made. There's nothing natural there. Um, and animals often eat it and get sick or 
It just generally pollutes the waters. Uh, so we can think about our use of plastic bags and not using them, um, using other things. There's even the plastic straws campaign, actually, uh, that's being managed uh, very well by Lonely Whale Foundation, uh, which is uh, founded by Adrian Grenier, uh, the actor from Entourage, the show. Uh, and it has raised uh, a lot of awareness about plastic straws, uh, plastic straws being symbolic overall for um, our heavy dependence on plastic these days. Uh, so I think these small and simple things that really don't take any time and are, don't cost any money, like our sunscreens or plastics or how we're eating, uh, all of these factors can really play a big role in keeping the oceans safe and thriving and uh, continuing well into the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I really appreciate that. In fact, uh, California just we we have a plastic straw ban going on that's going into effect soon. I can't remember when, but soon. So perfect. Yeah, California is ahead in a lot of ways, yes. and I Some... love California. I've been there twice. <laughs> It's beautiful. Yeah, um, it's it, and it's you know one of those states that's very different depending on which part you visit. I've uh, been to the Bay Area mostly in that region and not too many other places, but I'd love uh, to go to the southern part of the state and some other parts as well, perhaps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep, the Bay Area is beautiful. I agree. Um, but I do want to thank you so much for taking time out of your Saturday to talk to me about The Oyster Thief and your writing in general. Um, I really appreciated that you took the time to come on the show. Thanks so much, Sarah. I really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, I love uh, talking books and writing, and uh, you've clearly read it with a lot of uh, attention to detail and thought of these um, thoughtful questions. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for having me. Thank you. Once again, thank you so much to my guest, author Sonia Faruqi, for taking time to join me to talk about her book, The Oyster Thief. Thank you, uh, as always, to you, my listeners, for tuning in and going on these book journeys with me. I appreciate you more than you will ever know. Uh, as such, I do love a good giveaway, and I have one for this book. If you are intrigued to learn more about Coraline and Azar's story and to see this amazing world that Sonia put so much thought and effort and detail into, then you should definitely join the giveaway and try to win a copy. So to do that, it's very easy. All you have to do is go to one of our social media pages, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Those links are in the show description of this episode and or on our website. And just comment on this episode, episode 115, Interview with Sonia Faruqi. That's all you have to do. Just comment and you will be automatically entered to win a copy of The Oyster Thief. You have until Sunday, October 14th to enter, and then I'll be announcing the winners on Monday, October 15th. So good luck to you, and I hope that you take the time to enter, because who doesn't like free books? I know I like free books. At any rate... Uh, once again, thank you to Sonia. Thank you to you for joining me. I hope you will join me again on s Thursday. Yeah, I know my days of the week, really. I hope you will join me again on Thursday when I will be talking about um, some other books from my childhood. In this case, Newbery Award, uh, Newbery Medal winners. And so I'm looking forward to that. And I hope you will join me for that episode. In the meantime, I hope that you will go out there and get yourself lost in a good book. Thank you. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from Movie to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.